very practical section of the book of, uh, uh, of Romans that began in chapter 12 with the, the need to be fully committed to the Lord. And then that led to the area of, uh, of spiritual gifts and, uh, uh, and that uh, we're uh, to use those in a way that uh, build others up for, uh, for God's uh, glory. And, uh, and then the, the passage on, on love and, uh, and God's uh, uh, design and desire for us to love one another uh, in the body of Christ. Uh, and then leads into this practical area of the, the government uh, and believer. Uh, and we may not, uh, you know, we'd be very thankful, uh, frankly, just for the government that we have. And uh, I've been in a communist country many times. I've been in a Muslim country. And uh, uh, it's like they say, when you've been in those situations and you come back home again, you, you kind of think about kissing the ground because it's, it's a little different uh, uh, out, uh, out there. Uh, and God has, uh, has established government, is what Paul's going to say. Uh, therefore, um, under God, then we would respect and submit to uh, government, and uh, and of course there could be exceptions to that. And we'll we'll talk uh, a bit about that. Uh, but I, I did get this this week of uh, uh, definitions of different political systems because there's uh, different ones that are uh, that are out there. Uh, this this definition follows the idea of this uh, under communism. If you have two cows, uh, the government takes both of them and then gives you part of the milk. Uh, under socialism, if you have two cows, the government takes one uh, and gives it to your neighbor. Uh, under fascism, uh, if you have two cows, the government takes both cows and then sells you the milk. Uh, under Nazism, uh, you have two cows, the government takes both cows and then kills you. Uh, under uh, bureaucracy, you have two cows, the government takes both of them, shoots one, milks the other one, and then pours the milk down the drain. Uh, under capitalism, you have two cows. You sell one and buy a bull. Uh, in a democracy, everyone has two cows. Then a vote is taken. Whatever the majority decides to do, you do, and that's no bull. But uh, uh, <laughs> you want to save yourself from taking uh, political science 101 because you just got an overview of how all these different systems uh, work here. Uh, Paul's system wasn't a great one, living under the Roman Empire. Eventually, there would be three uh, Rome, uh, empire-wide persecutions uh, against the church. That has not happened yet. We're still very early on in the life of the church. Uh, the folks that he's writing to, Jews and Gentiles, but obviously most of this letter is addressed to the Jews, have already been under Claudius, driven out of Rome for a period of time over disputes about Christ, uh, and then they've been allowed to come back. So they've already suffered a little bit, but obviously it's going to get a lot worse uh, in, uh, in the future. Uh, but yet, uh, Paul is saying, even living under the Roman rule, uh, it's still a government, and God's the one that instituted government, and therefore we need to do our best to uh, submit uh, to that uh, government. There would come a time, of course, uh, when under the Roman Empire, they would adopt the policy that you had to say that Caesar was Lord, and put your pinch of incense, uh, on there, basically line up all the citizens one by one. They would pledge their uh, loyalty, and of course, uh, Christians couldn't do that. Uh, but uh, those times are yet uh, future for the church uh, here. Right now, the church, Christians, are still part of Judaism. Uh, again, you have different sects of Judaism, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the uh, you know, the Herodians, and so forth. And uh, the way uh, was the believers. And, uh, and so... Judaism is legal under the Roman uh, Empire. And, uh, and of course, one of the reasons that, that Luke writes the book of Acts uh, is to constantly prove uh, that, uh, that Christians should not be persecuted because we're part of Judaism. And so he goes in great detail. And every time Paul's on trial, he's found innocent. He's found innocent. He's found innocent. We should not be persecuted. We are part of a legal religion. So anyway, that's the context uh, that they're under at this time of this writing. Uh, worse things are going to come of what is demanded of Christians, and of course, eventually, uh, empire-wide persecution. We'll look at the principles. The authority to rule, we're saying, comes originally from God. That's Paul's uh, opening statement here in verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. 
Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So a couple of things about this. What is it God gave the government in order to rule over our lives? And again, it doesn't mean God's responsible for all the tyrants and uh, terrible things that uh, governments uh, do. Uh, but we would be uh, in big trouble if there was not governments. Uh, and however bad they are, uh, it's a terrible thing to have anarchy and have nobody uh, in charge. And if you... Uh, I haven't ever been in that kind of a situation. I pray that you haven't, actually, but it's, it's pretty strange. And uh, even in the places I've been around the world, there's always some semblance of, uh, uh, of, of government that I can relate to it a little bit, at least being in uh, India and trying to uh, go somewhere on the streets there and drive in the streets there because it's kind of lawless. There's no white line. There's no nothing. And um, <laughs> there's, uh, it's just kind of, kind of like a, a destruction derby. I mean, uh, people drive, uh, and uh, there's a car coming the other way. They both lay on their horn. Nobody hits the brakes. And, uh, and if that's a truck, you better get out of the way because he'll run you over. I was actually in a cab one time, and that was happening. And the, the guy turned and rode right up onto the area into this marketplace, like an Indiana Jones movie. People are jumping out of the way with their laundry and everything. Uh, so the truck didn't hit us, and then we dropped back down onto the road once the truck went, went by. And I had... I was with Mike Stengel, and he kind of is coaching me through. I've already got culture shock because we're in Calcutta, and just the, the poverty and everything that's there. He says, we're going to get a cab. It's going to be really wild. You're going to have to trust the sovereignty of God and kind of laugh through this whole thing, or you'll have a heart attack before we get to the train station. So you better figure out what you're going to do uh, before this guy comes. In fact, they, they, the, the, the guys that are really good drivers there, they refer to them as pilots. You know, so that's a little tip right there. It's, it's kind of crazy. Our... Uh, uh, our missionaries that were in Pakistan for a number of years, and this is prior to 9-11, they would go up into Afghanistan at that time to try to get the gospel up there to the uh, uh, Mujahideen. And, uh, and they said it was so wild. It was like the wild west. You would, when you leave kind of this area of, of Pakistan to go into Afghanistan, you'd be in a bus that you'd pay your fare to get in. And then uh, as you start out into this region, guy, guys would surround you in jeeps with automatic weapons all, all on them. And they're your guard. And they, they drive around the, you want to go on that bus, right? And they drive around the bus and fully uh, encircle it until you get to the next bus stop and uh, to a safer area. It was just whoever's got the, the most guns and the biggest guns wins. And uh, pretty wild. That's, that's with no government, basically. And, uh, and God instituted government because of sinful man. And, uh, and we need government uh, over us. Uh, and certainly, uh, it's not all good. We'd be in trouble without it. Richard Halverson, who's the uh, former chaplain of the United States Senate, uh, wrote this a number of years ago. He said, to be sure men will abuse and misuse the institution of the state, just as man, because of sin, has abused and misused every other institution in history including the Church of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't mean that the institution is bad or that it should be forsaken. It simply means that men are sinners and rebels in God's world, and this is the way they behave with good institutions. As a matter of fact, it is because of this very sin that there must be a human government to maintain order in history until the final and ultimate rule of Jesus Christ is established. Human government is better than anarchy, and the Christian must recognize the divine right of the state. And again, this is Paul uh, even writing uh, under Roman rule. And we certainly see God ordaining and establishing government in the prophecies uh, of, uh, of Daniel. You remember Daniel is taken in captivity. Uh, he has his prophecies of, of the empires that would come along the scene. You know, he's under the Babylonian rule. He says there will next be a... Uh, basically, it describes the Medo-Persian Empire. He describes the, uh, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, and so, and so forth. Uh, and of that, it says in Daniel 2.20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times of the seasons, and he removes kings and raises up kings. And God is in charge, and therefore, Daniel's able to predict these governments that would come into being in the ancient world. And of course, uh, Nebuchadnezzar himself had to go through a well-deserved humiliation to find out for a period of time who really was uh, in charge. 
And we also see it certainly in the teachings of Jesus in the, in the classic uh, confrontation with a group of young Pharisees and Herodians who normally hated each other, but uh, they came together or were united around the cause, sent as an official de delegation from the Sanhedrin to try to trap Jesus with a question. And the question is recorded in Matthew 22. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And of course, if Jesus says, oh yes, we should pay all of our taxes, then uh, many of his followers would be upset with him, saying that he'd sold out to the Romans who were oppressing them and so forth. But at the same time, if Jesus says, no, we should not pay our taxes, then they'll turn him into the authorities for insurrection. He's saying and preaching, telling people they should no longer pay taxes to Rome. Uh, he refers to them as hypocrites and says, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying uh, the tax. Whose portrait is on it? Whose inscription? Caesar, they replied. And he said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And we'd say it certainly was a, a brilliant answer because they answered both crowds. Uh, gives to what is Caesar's uh, that you owe him. But uh, ultimately, uh, your life should be given to God. Ken Hughes says that with this single sentence, our Lord established the validity of human government while at the same time setting its limits. Human government is valid, <clears throat> but there are limits that it should be able to place upon us as believers. He goes on and says that <clears throat> Caesar, Caesar had his image on things, and they rightly belong to him. There is a proper domain and function for human government. However, God has stamped his own image on man, the intellect, the will, and the soul bear the divine stamp. Thus, man may give outward things to Caesar, but the inner man belongs to God. So, hey, the government put its uh, uh, stamp uh, on some coins. So give that to them that God has his stamp uh, upon our, our lives. Therefore, because God has instituted government, and we are... God's uh, part of God's children. We're part of his kingdom. Uh, we've uh, uh, pledged our allegiance to him. Then we should be part of government uh, the best we can. There's certainly places in the world where that would not be allowed us as believers. Uh, there's places uh, in our own country today trying to prevent us from having a voice uh, in the public square uh, and uh, in government. Uh, but we owe an allegiance to God. God establishes government, therefore we should do our best to participate uh, and be part of it. Secondly, God expects every person to submit to the rule of government. Notice verse 1, uh, it's uh, every soul, some translations, every believer. But the everyone is emphatic. It's so strong that in verse 2 he concludes, consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against uh, what God has uh, instituted. And notice that every believer, it's everyone, and they are to submit. And that's a familiar word to us. It's a Greek word, uh, hupostasso, which is a military term, means to arrange under or in rank. And in the military, there's an array. There's a colonel, a lieutenant colonel, there's a major, there's a captain, there's a first lieutenant, a second, a two lieutenant. They're in rank under others. They don't get to decide who ranks the other ones. They're in a certain uh, order. Uh, that's the idea. It applies to going into the field. It applies to going into combat. Everybody is arranged under and has orders to follow. And if they don't stay arranged under, hupostasso, they don't submit, subject to that ranking placed on them, then things are not going to go well and people may die unnecessarily. It's very important. It's a military term. That's the term that is used here. And of course, that is the term that's used for all the other submissions that God has instituted in terms of employees, employers, yes, gals, even wives to their husbands, uh, in Ephesians 5, a hupostasso, to arrange under. Does that mean that one is better than the other one? Not at all. I mean, again, to choose the, the military illustration, uh, you can have a brand new uh, uh, second lieutenant, and he could be serving with a staff sergeant that's been around for about 10 years, and who knows more? The, we're hoping the lieutenant figures out that the, that the staff sergeant does real quick. It's not a matter of who knows more, who's more qualified, it's arranged under. Uh, we may uh, have many discussions about how we know better how the government should be run, and we might be right, <coughs> but we're still submitted to uh, and arranged under because after all, it's an institution ordained by God. 
Uh, Paul says this to Titus in chapter 3. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. And, uh, and again, the idea of rulers there is, uh, can be translated magistrates. Is a particular Roman official that he's talking about that nobody liked, uh, by the way. And, uh, but he says you still have to submit to their authorities. Uh, and uh, Peter tells us that we uh, should do it for the Lord's sake. First Peter 2.13. Again, Peter's writing this letter uh, later. And it's very close to the time of that first persecution. And if you read the letter, First Peter, you have a sense that, that, the, that he realizes that it's coming soon. And yet he says in chapter 2, verse 13, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Notice it's for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. <laughs> For this is the will of God, that by doing, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Uh, why does he say that? It's because natural man, the carnal man, is in rebellion, basically. And uh, I don't know if you know, there's a few people that just don't like to submit to the government. They don't like to submit to their employers. Uh, they do what they got to do. They do the minimal and hope they don't get caught. They just try to work the system, whatever is required. Uh, and it's all about... Uh, I don't like this, and I don't want somebody over me, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And it's kind of an epidemic in, in our own culture, because basically the, uh, the, uh, what's happened in the breakdown of the family for thousands of years in all cultures everywhere, that blanket statement, uh, basically kids were raised the same. Uh, and they were raised to respect and obey their parents and to respect <coughs> authority that was over them. That's why uh, back when I was a kid, uh, the earth was still just cooling. It was a long time ago. And uh, when I, there could be 30 kids in a, uh, in a first grade class. How many assistants did she have? None. Didn't really need anyone because the all kids all showed up terrified of any adult that went by. Absolute respect for any authority. There would be heavy consequences uh, if, uh, if you didn't. So they didn't need a lot of helpers, assistants, and so forth. And you could have big classes, and because all they were doing was actually teaching you. What a concept. Uh, but that's all changed in the 1960s. Uh, and as a result, uh, we've got uh, generations now that are pretty rebellious. Uh, he's making a point here. Listen to what Paul says in, in Romans 8, 7 earlier, talking about the carnal mind or the carnal man. He uses the same term. He says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject, as our word hupastaso, to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. There is a carnal mind, carnal person, the person that has come to faith in Jesus Christ. They're going to have a bent towards rebellion against God, God's law, against government, against any authority. So the idea of Peter, again, saying, by your behavior, you can deal with basically the foolish, ignorant arguments against you as a Christian. In other words, he says, don't act like a carnal, a carnal person. Act like a spiritual person. How do you do that? By submitting to the governing authority that's over you. But if you jump in with everybody else and you get your attitude and blah, 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 basically we're, we're saying that God's institution doesn't matter to me because I just don't like it. And, uh, and again, these weren't, this wasn't a great government that Paul was under. But he was still saying, for the Lord's sake, for the sake of our testimony, because God ordained it, uh, we need to submit to that authority. The spiritual man understands the need for authority in every avenue of life. Thirdly, the rule of government must sometimes be resisted. Let me get a few amens for that. Again, not every believer in every situation is going to be able to submit to a governing authority. And I'm going to give you at least three areas in which we should uh, resist uh, authority. Uh, if he's asked to violate a command of God, if we're asked to violate a command of God, well, there's times where we're going to have to say, I'm sorry there, Mr. Government person, uh, but I can't disobey God in order to obey you. And the classic example is in Acts chapter 4 and 5, again, where Peter and John are brought in, told to preach no longer in the name of Jesus, uh, and we find that they didn't listen to that. And of course, the people they're brought in before the Sanhedrin as like being brought before the Supreme Court of the day in terms of government authority over them. 
Uh, Acts 4, 17 says that, uh, but so that it spreads no further among the people, let us sever severely threaten them that from now on they speak uh, to no man uh, in this day, so, uh, in this way. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you or that God you judge. And of course, we know in reading the book of Acts that um, when, they, when they got back, a little prayer meeting, and they actually prayed for more boldness. By the way, they got beat before uh, they were threatened this way. When they got back, they didn't pray like, man, I hope that doesn't ever happen again. They actually got back and prayed for more boldness. Uh, and then in Acts 5, uh, we find these uh, words where they come back again and say, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's kind of our, our bottom line here. Uh, that there are times uh, when we may have to resist the government uh, that is uh, over us. And it, it can be a lot of areas. It is uh, uh, a lot of concerns that are out there. Uh, certainly if, uh, if the state of Hawaii institutes uh, gay marriage, same-sex marriage, uh, we will resist the government if they would try to require us to participate uh, in those weddings or the use of our facilities. It's all yet to be determined. There are states battling that uh, all over the, uh, the country right now. But just for an example, uh, the operating room nurse who suddenly is thrown into a situation where she says she has to assist for an abortion. Well, what does she do? Does she resist the authority, her employer, uh, and uh, because she knows that it's wrong in the sight uh, of God. Well, uh, there's Christians around the world that face these things each uh, and every day. And uh, I could have used a lot of examples for this, but, but this week, if you saw my fe uh, post on Facebook, uh, uh, Pastor Samuel Lamb went to be with the Lord. He pastored in Guangzhou for a number of years. And on several occasions, we had the opportunity to visit him, visit his church, and smuggle Bibles. There you go. Yes, we were actually not submitting to the governing authorities of communist China because we were obeying uh, the command of God, which was to take the word, take the gospel, uh, into the whole world. We better obey God rather than, than man. And um, so we would visit with, uh, with Samuel Lamb. And I want to show you a little videotape. It was the last time we saw it. It was in uh, 2004. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, he's uh, talking about uh, how long he was in prison. Uh, he's talks, uh, he'll make reference to the fact that when he's being interrogated by the PSV, the uh, police, that uh, he actually tells them, well, you know, uh, well, just arrest me. He's 75 years old at the time. He's 78 when he's talking to us. Uh, he says, just arrest me because I'm well suited for prison life. <laughs> I've already been there over, over 20, 20 years. So we give this uh, a shot. Uh, just great to be with him once again. Before I went to prison, 1955, we have an audience only once a week, 400. After I came out from prison, from four persons up to nine members. 1990, confiscation. You know, confiscation. Oh, oh we were in the old house, Dama Dai. Now we moved here 20 months. 1990, in the old house, over 60, all in uniform, came up. Took the things away. Closed our church. Called me to the government hall. Talked to me 21 hours. I slept only a few minutes, but they slept by turn. I was 22. When I came out to preach, this one just came out from prison, 54 years old. It looked like older than now, 54. My wife died two years ago, oh no, two years before I came out to, uh, from prison. She died two years before. My father died seven years before I came out. My father was a Baptist pastor. He was in Detroit, Michigan. He went to Niagara, New York. Do you know Niagara? Uh, CMA, Christian Mission Alliance. Mm. 
My father was under A.P. Simpson, the founder. He died seven years before I came out. <coughs> my mother left. If my mother died early, I couldn't come back there. No father, no mother, no wife. They won't let you come back. And uh, I was in North China. They will uh, uh, let, let me work in North China. But the Lord let my mother left. I came back. When I came back, 11 months, my mother go, uh, went away also. But I came back. Anger and temper look like uh, after you believe Jesus. Uh, you see? Anger and temper. After you believe Jesus. I'm sorry, this is only Chinese, eh? but only a verse. Matthew. 11 23rd, you see, 11 23rd, but, but this, this word, Matthew. Burden of sin, come to Jesus, all set free. Very red, do you know? In China, red means very good, huh? but my teachers red mark more than my black. Do you understand? <laughs> the correction, red. More than my black. <laughs> my father said, best smell. <laughs> if you call me to write even one book, by no means. But now the Lord let me write 104. I'm going to write 105. All from God. The German, after 1990, confiscation, I just told you, huh? after 1990, they called me many, many times. They talk to me, the government talk to me many times. They want me to register. Then, controlled by the government. If I register, I couldn't preach revelation, the second coming of Christ, etc. Therefore, many house churches in China don't register. Suffer persecution. The last time they called me, 1999, October, three years ago, in Damajan. Tuesday morning, during our meeting, over 60 come up, call the people go away. But some don't go away, they call me to call them to go. I said, no, let them, let them hear. They said, we, talk, we want to talk to you. Oh, just outside, there's a room. They talk to me outside the room, from 9.30 up to quarter past 12 a.m. And inside the people, they sang and prayed. Pray and sang from 9.30 up to quarter past 12. And, and some policemen went out, oh, nice hymn. <laughs> they, they, nice hymn. <laughs> then they talked to me and I said, you arrest me again. I called them to arrest me again. Because I was old, uh, then 50, uh, 75, now 78, uh, three years ago, 75. You arrest me again, I'm old. Uh, and I, I am used to prison life. Because I've been twice in prison, the first time, 16 months only, but the second time, over 20, 20 years. I'm used to. And I suffer some diseases, and they ask me, what diseases? I said, this and that. Oh, take care of you. I said, thank you. <laughs> but I'm not registered. Different estimates, uh, but there's more Christians in China than in any other nation, about uh, at least 80 million or so. And, uh, and most of them are part of the house church, unregistered, because as you heard uh, Pastor Lamb say, if you're part of the government three self church, then you've got to... Uh, you can't, you, you, you're very strict. You can't preach, preach on the second coming. People can't attend the church until they're over 15 years old. Uh, there's, uh, you've got somebody from the uh, Communist Party uh, listening to all your messages. And in the bigger cities, they're editing the pastor's messages before they're, they're giving. So he's kind of, uh, the, the lot, there were three, three pastors uh, that were basically the kind of the, uh, grew the, the house church movement in China, and uh, he was one. We got to be able to 
<laughs> be with Alan Ewan, who was in Beijing uh, a couple of times as well, but tremendous men have gotten. But the whole point is that he tells his people every week to be good citizens. You know, don't join the Communist Party, but be a good citizen. Obey the government as much as you possibly can. But when it goes against the command of God, then we, we can't do that. So he would, uh, he would never register. But anyway, with the Lord uh, this week, and I'm sure uh, a great reward, but it was always uh, just a great time to, uh, to be there. And we always had the, uh, everyone on the trip read his, his uh, biographer before we, uh, we went along. And all those young kids are grown men now. <laughs> so it's, if it goes against the command of God, we're to resist. Secondly, Christians must resist when asked to do an immoral act. You know, certainly sexual uh, uh, things that apply here, but other things, uh, ethical areas, falsifying records, uh, lying, asked to be lied, uh, to lie in order to cover up for somebody else and so forth. Uh, these things a Christian cannot do, even if their government or another government employee is, uh, is asking them. Three believers must never go against their Christian conscience in order to obey uh, the government. And so... It's going to vary person to person. We all have a conscience, and uh, uh, and we need to be able to make sure we have a clear conscience uh, in regards to obeying the government. So God establishes the governments. It's his institution to keep sinful man in check, so there would be some uh, law in order. Uh, we're supposed to submit everyone, uh, hupostasso, because of the rank, because of the order. Uh, even if we can't respect the person, we respect the office and we're to submit. And there are times, perhaps, when we resist and do not do that. But if we do, we better have very good biblical reasons. We better have a chapter and verse to support uh, what we're doing. And we probably should get some godly counsel and pray about it uh, before, we, uh, before we do. But there are those occasions. Uh, and then there are the consequences, like uh, Samuel Lamb going to uh, prison for over 20 years, for example. So the authority to rule comes originally from God. Secondly, Paul deals with the role of government uh, itself in verse 3 to 4. Uh, the ruler, ruler, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. You want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you'll have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. Uh, but if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So the, the nature of government itself, uh, the role is that it's supposed to be that of a minister. See that in verse 4, for he is God's minister. That's a word that we sometimes translate uh, servant. Uh, Greek is diakonos, and it means deacon. Government is the deacon of God, uh, and he's to, quote, humbly serve. Sometimes we see those in government are to be public servants, and this is where that idea comes from. Again, they don't always uh, act that way. Uh, you, don't, uh, you don't see it, uh, certainly, in places around the world. And neither did you at times in the nation of Israel. By the time the, the book of Judges ends, it ends with a verse that says, And everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Because there were judges, uh, but the judges were not always serving the people. And there was a complete breakdown uh, and really chaos and almost anarchy. Uh, even in Israel during that period of time. And of course, then God raises up uh, uh, Samuel to, uh, to take over and be uh, a judge and represent him and his government. Uh, but it's meant to be serving the people. Secondly, in terms of the role, it's meant to protect the people. And we could go all the way back to Genesis chapter 6 where God institutes capital punishment. If someone murders someone else, then the government in charge is supposed to basically try and convict uh, and bring that person to, uh, to justice. Uh, again, so the purpose of government is to protect human life. Uh, and of course, primarily it does, and we're thankful for it here in this country. Of course, where that breaks down is uh, the issue of uh, uh, the unborn, <coughs> where the government currently is not protecting human life. Uh, but God's way of dealing with evil Again, it's not by personal vengeance, it's by a government uh, authority. And uh, he says, and they don't bear the sword for nothing. God gives them the sword to execute judgment. Therefore, uh, government exists. Government then swears in and has law enforcement officers who are acting on behalf of that government. 
somebody uh, commits a crime, we call the police, they go after the bad guys, uh, and therefore uh, that's all part of God's design. Part of God's design, of course, to protect is the military. When the military swears left their right hand, swears to uh, uphold the Constitution, uh, they are participating in a God-ordained institution. God ordains government. He gives them the sword to be able to carry out and for the purpose of protecting its citizens. So I've said before, if you're uh, uh, served in the military or serving in the military, you're actually functioning in, in an institution ordained uh, by God. And uh, certainly we thank the Lord for that. And uh, we also thank the Lord that uh, non-Christians are willing to do it as well. I mean, Christians, it's like uh, it's almost like a given role. You can just walk right in as a, a Christian and go, man, this is God's institution. He set the whole thing up. I can partic uh, participate in the practice of protecting our, our citizens. Uh, but we thank the Lord there's even non-Christians that uh, would want to do that, all instituted by God for the purpose of serving the people for the purpose of protecting the people. And then thirdly, the role of government, according to the Bible, is to protect personal and property rights. And we could uh, do a whole study on that, but uh, uh, all the way back to uh, the book of Exodus, but in Deuteronomy chapter 1, uh, verse 12, talks about how to handle personal property uh, disputes, whether it's land or possessions. Uh, in uh, chapter 16 of the same book, uh, God gave judges to rule over the people. In chapter 7, there's an appellate court system uh, that is developed so that if you go to court and you don't like what the judge renders as a verdict, there is an appeal that you can go to as well. Uh, and, of course, our own judiciary system is very much modeled by what God established in the, uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, the fourth role of government, again, is the obvious to punish those who do evil. Verse 4, but if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he's God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So if you're a lawbreaker, you live with some degree of fear, depending upon the law or laws that you disobey. Uh, if you believe that uh, the H3 freeway really is the Hawaiian Autobahn as you cross it uh, early in the morning uh, and uh, you're not really looking at your speedometer, you're just checking uh, weather conditions uh, and if there's anybody up ahead with one of those little black hair dryers pointed at you uh, or not, uh, but see as you blaze down the other side, there's an element of fear because of the consequences that may await you, for example. Uh, but uh, if you're holding it to 55, uh, you're not in fear, uh, is the idea. And I can tell you, before I became a Christian, I lived in fear all the time because I was always afraid of what could happen next. I was always afraid that uh, being arrested, because uh, there was reasons why I should be arrested. Uh, I was always afraid that when I got home, somebody might have poisoned my dogs to get into my house for the illegal possessions that I possessed there. Uh, and I lived in fear a lot. When you disobey the law of God, you live in an element of fear, and it makes you paranoid uh, after a while. What Paul's saying here is absolutely true. Uh, if you do evil, be afraid. Uh, they don't bear the sword for nothing. Uh, that's part of the role of government, and we need it because of sinful man. Uh, the authority to rule comes from God, and the role of government is primarily to protect us the reason believers are to obey are given in verses 5 and 6. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Before, because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. So we are to obey because it's God's command. Uh, the authorities come from God. God ordains the authorities. Uh, you know, not, not obeying is, uh, is not an option. Uh, they are in that position. It's a command of God. Secondly, uh, we find uh, that it has to do with consequences. Again, uh, verse 2 says, if we disobey, we'll bring judgment upon ourselves. Paul says this uh, in writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 9. He says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and the insubordinate. For the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, 
And if there's any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine, the law in a sense is not made for righteous people who are obeying God anyway. It's made for the unrighteous in order to bring them in check and bring them into submission. So there is law and order. So consequences, if we don't submit, they don't bear the sword for nothing. And then thirdly, uh, it's for conscience sake, uh, verse 5. Uh, we all have an awareness of right and wrong. The Bible says that uh, some people have a weak conscience. Some people have disobeyed so much, they have a seared conscience. So Paul says in Romans chapter 2 early on, why we're all accountable to God, whether we're religious or non-religious, because we all have a conscience. We all have a sense of right and wrong. And he says we should obey because of the command, the consequences, and our own conscience sake. Those are the reasons that he gives here. And then fourthly, verse 7 has to do with taxes. So we're going to skip this because of, you know, actually the reality. This is uh, of uh, obedience. This is uh, his uh, illustration here. Verse 7, render therefore to all uh, uh, their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs or different fees uh, to whom customs, uh, to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. So the reality is seen, and again, this is not just the only thing we're supposed to obey, uh, but uh, it is uh, certainly uh, uh, one of the ways uh, given here. And uh, and uh, just to tell you, uh, what was a tax break in, uh, in, uh, in the Roman world? It wasn't good, I can just tell you that. I mean, they, they exhorted a lot from the people. So this is a huge thing that, uh, that Paul, uh, a very sore point among people, as it is uh, uh, probably for uh, us today, uh, if you pay a lot of taxes, uh, and if you don't, then, uh, then we need you to repent by the time we're, we're done here. But that's the point. Uh, we live, uh, again, in a, in a culture and, uh, where uh, people think, uh, Christians can even think, and think that they can justify because the government is wrong in areas, because government is unjust in areas, because they, and you can make your list. <coughs> if you try to make your list long enough so that you can justify your short list over here, of why you're not paying all the taxes that are due. Not that you should have a good accountant and uh, not pay any more than the, the law requires and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have an obligation to God to pay our taxes. Uh, and it's very difficult in this area of finances, wouldn't you agree, uh, to not pay our taxes and disobey God and at the same time ask God to bless the area of our lives in terms of our finances. You have a little, you see there's a little, little problem with that? and. Uh, and so uh, just an area uh, that uh, Paul deals with, very important. Uh, but it gets worse because he says we're not only just to pay it, uh, but we're to pay it with the right attitude. Uh, something about honor, to whom uh, honor is, uh, is due here. Ray Stedman uh, says you have a right, of course, as does everyone, to protest injustice and to correct abuse. Uh, but don't forever be grumbling about the taxes uh, that you have to pay. Then he goes on, he talks about when he, for years as a young preacher, <coughs> he never made, made enough money to pay any taxes. So it, was, uh, it wasn't an issue for him. But once he did, uh, then he couldn't believe how much taxes he was having to pay. It was uh, pretty upset by it. He said the first time he had to write a check to the IRS, uh, he, he, he wrote it out to the Infernal Revenue uh, Service, because <laughs> they cashed it anyway. Uh, the next year, uh, he wrote it out to the Eternal Revenue Service. And, uh, and he, uh, in finding, uh, in doing a study in Romans, realized that he was really sinning. Uh, that he was, uh, uh, he needed to pay his taxes, but he needed to change his attitude about it as well. Because they're God's authority. Uh, God has set them up, allowed them to exist. They're primarily there to, uh, to protect us, uh, whether they're doing a good job or a bad job. It would be a lot worse uh, if we didn't have them uh, in place. We are just really blessed, obviously, and very fortunate. And uh, sometimes uh, you'll hear people say, the United States is the greatest nation on the planet, and I think it is. And if you're not sure about that, travel. Just travel a little, and, uh, and you'll find that out to be very true for many reasons. For many reasons. Uh, our, our, our justice system uh, and uh, right on through uh, the rights that we have and of course, those rights and some of those freedoms of Christians are being eroded, and we should be very concerned about it. Uh, but uh, we and we want to make our voice uh, be heard. <clears throat> but at the same time, uh, it's hard to do that if we're not cooperating with the system that we're trying to work with. Uh, and so again, the believers to fulfill, fulfill his governmental 
obligations with a, a good attitude. Again, the authority to rule comes from God. Early church fathers uh, bear this out in their writings. Tertullian, who uh, lived 160 to 240, uh, wrote this. He says, we are uh, living under the Roman rule. We offer prayer for the safety of our princes to the eternal, the true, the living God, whose favor beyond uh, all other things they must themselves desire. Without ceasing for our emperors, we offer prayer. We pray for life prolonged, for security for the empire, for protection for the imperial house, uh, for brave armies, a faithful senate, a virtuous people, uh, the world at rest. Uh, their, their government, uh, they had, and the freedoms they had that were limited, uh, vastly different than ours, and yet uh, uh, here they are praying for the government, praying for their governmental leaders, and certainly uh, we need to do the same. The role of government primarily is to protect us, uh, and the reasons we obey its command, uh, there are consequences, uh, and we have a conscience uh, as well. Uh, as I was uh, reading a little bit about this and thinking about this, I've read uh, uh, a couple of books about uh, uh, some of what happened to the church uh, in, uh, in Germany. Uh, and one of the writers pointed out the fact, for example, <clears throat> when Hitler comes on the scene and begins to impose a tremendous segregation, against the Jewish people. It was very obvious something bad was about was happening uh, and it could get worse. There was enough Christians in Germany in the time, pre-World War II, uh, that if they with one voice spoke out against it, most historians said they could stop it all right then. Uh, but they didn't. And certainly that's a, that's a warning for us. Uh, as, as things wound up and Hitler gained even more control and solidified what he was doing and had the people in fear for their lives and so forth, then there were very few voices that spoke up uh, on behalf of the Jews. One of them, of course, was uh, 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 Pastor Martin Niemöller. And uh, as to, after he was arrested for continuing to speak out about the truth based on the, uh, on the Bible, uh, he was in prison. Uh, and then there was another Christian that was actually working as a prison guard. And, uh, and he said to him, uh, Pastor Niemöller, why are you in prison? And uh, he was a little upset. And he said uh, angrily, he says, and brother, why are you not in prison? <laughs> that was the, the real question as far as he was concerned. Uh, government is there. It's established by God. We need to submit Vasaso to it because God instituted. Peter says it's for the, for the Lord that we, we do it. It's not perfect. It's not great. But there may be times when we have to speak out against it, you know, voice our concerns, be involved in the system. If God set the whole thing up and we are gods, we should be part of uh, the system uh, of government itself. And of course, one of the uh, things that's uh, hurt uh, Christianity in the United States of America is a withdrawal from, uh, from government for a period of time. Uh, we're kind of making our voices heard again. We're at a tipping point in terms of what uh, is going on in our country, uh, in terms of uh, righteous things that, that could happen, unrighteous things that could continue to prevail. Uh, and we need to be praying for our, our country. We need to pray for our leaders. Uh, and we, we're praying not just for godly leaders to be elected. We're primarily praying for that, but we pray for a revival. We could get a few godly leaders, as we can see in Israel they had at times, but they were never able to change the hearts of the people. They could bring in, bring in Josiah and some of the others some, some great reform for a period of time, but it was only for a short period of time. Uh, we certainly need to be praying for our government, our leaders, and, and for the church and the country today. Amen.